Good morning and happy Sabbath. Welcome to the Mentone Seventh-day Adventist Church. We're so glad that you joined us here for worship. For those that are watching online, we want to say welcome uh, wherever you may be watching from. Maybe you're watching from your car, maybe you're watching in your home, in your living room, wherever you may be. So glad that you could join us here as we worship together uh, here at the Mentone Seventh-day Adventist Church on September 11th. 2021. Let's go ahead and bow our heads for a word of prayer and ask God's Holy Spirit to be here with us as we begin. Pray with me. Uh, Father, we thank you so much that you have given us yet another Sabbath day, a holy, sacred 24 hours of rest. Away from the distractions of this world, we want to come to you with bended hearts, with hearts full of gratitude and humility, recognizing that without you we're nothing. Please guide us. Please inspire us from your word. May you speak today. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus and all of God's people said, Amen and Amen. Exactly 20 years ago, on September 11th, 2001, at 8.45 a.m., on a clear Tuesday morning, an American Airlines Boeing 767, loaded with 20,000 gallons of jet fuel, crashed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center in New York City. The impact left a gaping, burning hole near the 80th floor of the 110-story skyscraper, instantly killing hundreds of people and trapping hundreds more in higher floors. As the evacuation of the tower and its twin tower got underway, television cameras were broadcasting live images of what initially appeared to be a freak accident. But then 18 minutes after the first plane hit, a second Boeing 767 Airlines, United Airlines Flight 175 appeared out of the sky, turned sharply toward the World Trade Center, and sliced into the south corner or tower near the 60th floor. Well, as millions watched the events unfolding in New York, and I'm sure that each of you can remember exactly where you were on that day. I was in eighth grade at Coble Elementary School, a small Seventh-day Adventist school in Calhoun, Georgia. My teacher ran into the room and we didn't have televisions there in the room with the ability to broadcast live TV, but she encouraged us to turn on the radio and we listened to what was happening. And as people were watching these events unfold in New York, American Airlines Flight 77 circled over downtown Washington, D.C., before crashing into the west side of the Pentagon military headquarters at 9.45 a.m. Jet fuel from the Boeing 757 caused a devastating fire that led to the structural collapse of a portion of the giant concrete building, which, as we know, is the headquarters for the U.S. Department of Defense. 125 military personnel and civilians were killed in the Pentagon, along with the 64 people aboard the airliner. And then, less than 15 minutes of the, after the terrorists struck the nerve center of the U.S. military, the Pentagon, the catastrophe in New York unfortunately took a worse turn when the South Tower of the World Trade Center collapsed into a, a massive cloud of, of dust and smoke. The structural steel of the skyscraper, built to withstand, uh, you know, uh, excess of 200 miles per hour and, and even fire, it could not withstand the, the heat that was generated by the burning jet fuel. And at 10.30 a.m., the north building of the Twin Towers collapsed. Only six people in the World Trade Center towers at the time of their collapse survived, and, and almost 10,000 people were treated for injuries many severe. And meanwhile, a fourth California-bound plane, United Flight 93, was hijacked about 40 minutes after leaving the New York, or excuse me, the Newark Liberty International Airport in New Jersey. 
And because the plane was delayed in taking off, passengers on board had learned of, of events that were taking place and they fought the four hijackers and attempted to attack the, the cockpit with the fire extinguisher. The plane flipped over and sped toward the ground at upwards of 500 miles per hour, crashing in a real field near Shanksville in western P Pennsylvania at 10.10 10 a.m. As we all later found out, 19 militants associated with the Islamic extremist group Al-Qaeda had hijacked four airplanes and carried out suicide attacks against targets in the United States. Almost 3,000 people, close to, just a, a few shy of 3,000 people were killed on September 11th, 2001 in those terrorist attacks. One of those individuals that passed away was 41-year-old Kang Nuenge. He was an electronics engineer who worked as a contractor for the Navy, and he was killed when American Airlines Flight 77 crashed into the Pentagon, and it was a direct hit in the area where he worked. His son, On, was only three and a half years old, and, and right now On is working on his master's degree from George Mason University. He's a 24-year-old software engineer, and, and a reporter recently caught up with On and his mother to talk about their memories and, and what took place. And they're looking for, they look, they're looking through a, a family photo album together, and the first is, is of a one-year-old On. He's cuddling on his father's lap. The next picture is, is three-year-old on riding high on his dad's shoulder at their home in, in Fairfax, Virginia. But then there's another family picture that is drastically different than the first two. There he is, having just turned four years old, wearing uh, some traditional Vietnamese clothing for mourning, weeping over his father's casket at just four years old. Another family picture of On shows him as a little boy. He's got khaki overalls, and he's standing just outside of the Pentagon, taken a few days after the attack. He's clutching an orange safety fence. The orange safety fence has white flowers all over it. And when the plane struck the building, a whole section is gone, and you can see in this picture an entire section of the Pentagon that's blackened, a gaping hole opened to the sky. In a picture book that he made in elementary school, On wrote, When my father died, it seemed like I lost a huge part of me. I, I forgot everything about him. I was very sad when he died, but I still love him so much. And to illustrate this page in this picture book that On made in elementary school, On sketched a jet plane about to crash into the Pentagon, and On drew himself to one side with a tear falling down his face. You can read more about some of these children who lost their parents, mother, father, in these terrorist attacks on September 11th, 2001, and they're absolutely tragic. I read about a, a brother and sister who the mother was just uh, maybe eight Eight months pregnant, I think, when, when, when uh, her husband passed away. And so this girl never got to meet her dad. There's pictures, there's memories. She felt jealous of her two-and-a-half-year-old brother when he was two-and-a-half when his father died. At least he had some memories of their dad. Over 3,000 people killed in one day. And we have to ask ourselves questions like, why? Why? Why did God allow this terrorist attack? Why didn't God stop it? Why didn't God intervene? Now, often when we experience and we come across human suffering, like the recent attack in Afghanistan there at the airport, killing hundreds, we can sometimes emotionally be removed from those situations because they're, they're far away. And there's so much 
sadness, so much pain, so much suffering in our world. I know for me personally, that's often the case. I find myself removed. But when human suffering hits home, when, when, when it comes to your door and your family, that's when the pain becomes more real. That's when you start asking those questions. Why God? God, why didn't you save my brother Daniel? My brother Daniel who lost his life, who, who died of brain cancer at the young age of 24 years old. Why God? God, why is my eight-year-old nephew Rowan have a degenerative disease and probably will not live a full life? Can't walk like a normal eight-year-old? Can't run in a wheelchair? Why God? Those are questions that I'm asking when suffering comes knocking at your door, when, when evil comes face to face with you. That's what happened to Harold Kushner. He was a prominent American, is a prominent American rabbi and author. He wrote a book called When Bad Things Happen to Good People. His son was diagnosed with pro Geria syndrome, which causes victims to, to age faster than usual. It leads their body to be older than they technically are. And if you look at someone with a progeria syndrome, they don't have any hair, their heads are a little larger, and, and they look old but, but young at the same time. His son passed away, and, and he began to ask these questions of why God? If, if God is all-powerful, and if God is all-loving, then he would have kept my son from getting progeria, much less dying of it. So he concluded, if, if that's the case, if God was all-loving and all-powerful, then he would have and he could have prevented my son from dying of this disease. So therefore, God can be all-loving or all-powerful, but not both. That's what Kushner came to believe. In his mind, he chose to believe that that God is a God of love, but not a God of power. He's a God who cares and, and he's loving, but he isn't able to intervene in certain circumstances. If God is all powerful, then he can stop all evil. He has the power, the ability to stop terrorist attacks. But Kushner says, well, God isn't all powerful. He's all loving, but not all powerful. David Hume, the, the 16th century Scottish humanist and philosopher, uh, wrestled with those questions. And, and he said, if, if God is, is, is not all-powerful, in his words, if God is willing to prevent evil but not able, then he's impotent. God is impotent. If he can't stop evil, he's an impotent God. Unable, weak, powerless. He said if, if God is, is able to stop evil, he, he's all-powerful, but not willing, then he's malevolent. He's malicious. He's mean. If God can stop evil but isn't stopping it, God is not a good God. Hume thought. And then Hume said this, if, if, if God is both able and willing, whence then is evil? How can there be evil if God is all-powerful and all-loving? Friends, we need to wrestle with these questions. We need to wrestle with these questions because there's a world out there that is wrestling with these questions. I've forgotten his name, but back in the 60s and 70s, there was an individual in Israel... He was a prominent uh, politician, and he essentially became an atheist. He practiced Judaism. He believed in the culture. But eventually, he stopped believing in God because of the Holocaust. How could a God of love allow that, he said? Six million Jews being exterminated. Some being gassed out, some being shot, entire groups of people being shot and put in mass graves. There were Nazi doctors that experimented with Jewish children, putting them in, in big pots of boiling water to see how long they'd stay alive. Doing experiments on live children. 
That is evil, my friends. And it made an atheist out of this individual. We need to wrestle with these questions because the world is asking, if God is so good, why is the world so bad? Why is there evil in our world? Now let me ask you a question, friends. Let's first of all establish from Scripture some character qualities about God. Is God all-powerful? Is God able to stop terrorist attacks? Can He do anything? Well, let's quickly go through some Bible verses, and you can turn there. I'm going to go quickly through there, so if you want to listen to them, you can, or you can turn there quickly. But Psalm 147, verse 5. Psalm 147, verse 5 says, Great is our Lord, and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. Psalm 147, 5, the psalmist says, Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond all measure. Job, chapter 42, verse 42, uh, Job says, I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. Job 40, 42, verse 2, I know that you can do everything, Job says. Matthew 19, verse 26, Matthew chapter 19, verse 26, Jesus looked at them and said, With men... This is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Matthew 19, verse 26, with God, all things are possible. Jeremiah 32, verse 17, O oh Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arms. There is nothing too hard for you. Is God a powerful, omnipotent, God. Is He all-powerful? The answer is clearly yes. God can stop evil. My God, your God is not a weak God. He's not an impotent God. He spoke things into existence at creation. God is an almighty, powerful God. Is God a God of love? Does He want to stop evil? Does He care? about human beings that suffer. Let's again go to the scriptures. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. The Bible says that, and we know this, don't we, church, that God is what, everyone? God is love. God is a God of love. Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth. When the glory of God passed before Moses, the glory of God is his character, and God's character, Exodus tells us, is merciful, gracious, long suffering, patient. Matthew 10 29 and 31. Matthew chapter 10, verse 29 and 31. We're told, Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? Jesus is talking here, he's saying, And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your Father's will. But the very hairs of your head are numbered. Do not fear, therefore. You are of more value than sparrows. God says, I take care of the spirit. I don't, just, I don't just have sympathy for human suffering. I care about the birds. I care if they fall. And if I care if the birds fall, I certainly care for you. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. The Lord is not slack or slow concerning His promise, as some count slackness. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. But God is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is a God of love. He cares for you. He loves you. He has a plan for you. God wants to stop evil. He does not want anyone to die. God is all-powerful. He can put an end to evil. God could stop all evil with a word. God wants to stop evil. He has compassion for those who are suffering. He's all loving. Those are very true statements. So the question is, why doesn't he do it now? Why does God not intervene right now? And that question has caused many debates throughout history. Many scholars and philosophers have wrestled over that question. It's called the, the, the problem of, of evil or theodicy. If God is so good, why is the world so bad? 
And part of the reason that people and humanity have struggled with this question for years is because it's a difficult question. The, the Bible calls it the mystery of iniquity. Sin and evil is a hideous, mysterious force that, that can't always be explained. But, but there are some things that we do know. There are some things that we do know about human suffering, evil, and a good, loving God. And we want to look at this morning... On September 11th, 2021, 20 years after the terrorist attacks here in America, we want to look at five things we do know. Five things we do know about a good God but a bad world. About evil and sin and why God isn't intervening right now. And I invite you to, first of all, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, Jesus tells a series of parables, uh, the parable of the sower, we know well. And in verse 24, he sets forth another parable, a story with a deeper meaning to them. Verse 24, the Bible says, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. There's a farmer. He goes out and he, he sows wheat, good seed in his field. But, verse 25, while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. And now, I learned that this Greek term for tares, the Greek word zizanion, is, is generally understood to refer to darnel, which is an undesirable weed that actually bears an uncanny resemblance to wheat. And, in fact, the resemblance between wheat and darnel is sometimes so close that darnel is called false wheat. Darnel is considered poisonous, and ingesting the weed causes feelings of, of drunkenness and can prove fatal. And somebody came in and sowed darnel, poisonous wheat among the wheat. It looked like wheat, but it wasn't. It was Darnell. An enemy came and did this, the parable says. Verse 26, but when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. And the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have Darnell? How does it have weeds? How does it have this poisonous substance? Why is there evil in this field? And the farmer gives a fascinating response. Verse 28, the farmer said to his servants, an enemy has done this. Five simple words that share with us some encouraging facts about God. An enemy has done this. You read on in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus explains the parable. He says that the farmer the master is, is, is the son of, of man, is Jesus. And he comes and, and sows the gospel seeds. And the enemy is none other than Satan himself, the deceiver of souls. God doesn't take responsibility for the evil in this world. It does not come from, it does not originate in the heart of God. Evil is not from God. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. We know these verses well, but in case not. And we'll go there anyway. Revelation chapter 12. and verse 7 it says, a, And war broke out in heaven. That's a fascinating verse. You would think that if someone was talking to you, oh, war broke out in Afghanistan or, or war broke out in the Middle East. Those are things that, that wouldn't surprise us. But this is a surprising statement to someone who is not familiar with biblical stories and, and theology. A war broke out where? In heaven. I thought heaven was a place of love. I thought heaven was a, a place of, of peace and happiness. War broke out in heaven? Michael and his angels, Jesus and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought. This was not a physical war, but a polemic war. A war of, of words. A war of ideas. 
Verse 8, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. We know the biblical story well, don't we, friends? That Isaiah 14 tells us that Lucifer, Lucifer originated evil. The possibility has always been there since eternity. When God created beings, there was the possibility of evil. Free will has to allow for that. And Lucifer started harboring thoughts of, of jealousy, thoughts of, of evil, of pride and sin. Wanted to be higher than God. Ezekiel 28 tells us that, that his position as, as the head of all, all, all music, the head of all the angels, as he looked at his beauty and his position, iniquity arose in his heart. Iniquity doesn't come from God. doesn't originate with him. And that, that evil that was there in heaven, unfortunately, came down to planet Earth. We know from reading stories like, like Job that that God wants to. He, he wants to intervene in this process of evil. Uh, but, but God doesn't always. And, and you may ask why. If evil doesn't originate from God, why, why doesn't God just step in? Those are tough questions. We're, we're seeking to try to, to look at some biblical answers. But one thing that, that has helped me is, is knowing that while, yes, God is all-powerful, there are boundaries with omnipotence. Can God, this is the question that my friends and I used to discuss growing up, can God create a rock so big that he can't lift? Can he? If God is all-powerful, can he create a, a rock so big that he can't lift it? Well, if he created a rock so big that he can't lift it and he can't lift it, then he's maybe not all powerful. Can God create a, a circle that actually is a square? When you put edges on it, does it automatically become a square? Can God create a triangle with four sides instead of three? Maybe these are, are silly questions, but, but it helps us realize that a God of omnipotence, maybe, maybe limitations isn't the right word, but, but there's boundaries and one of those boundaries is the boundary of free will, something that God cannot cross. If God would have immediately destroyed Lucifer and destroyed Satan right then and there, he messed up, he knew, looking into the future, what sin would produce. Then instantly, everyone would distrust God. If somebody got on the news channels and started making terrible claims about the president. And I know this happens all the time, but, but, but imagine a world where that doesn't happen very often and someone starts making accusations against some important leader. He's making them, he's making them, and making them. And then, very soon after those accusations of how terrible a person this is, suddenly that leader, the president, is assassinated. And all eyes are going to go to the person that destroyed the leader. Wait a second. Was it you? Did you do it? Or if we looked at it differently, uh, imagine if that person making all those accusations, he kept on making those accusations against the leader, and suddenly the person making the accusations was eliminated, was killed. People would look to the leader, the president, and say, hey, why did you kill him? Maybe those accusations are true. And that's exactly what happened with Lucifer. If, if God would have immediately snuffed out Lucifer, people would have begun to question, well, maybe what Lucifer is saying about, maybe God isn't a God of love. Maybe he's not a God of, of justice. Maybe he's not a fair God. God has the long game in mind with evil. One thing we know about evil is that it doesn't originate from God. The Bible is clear on that. The second thing that we know about evil, as we think about this problem, is, is that suffering and evil breaks God's heart. He, he's not aloof to this problem. 
Let's go ahead and go to Exodus chapter 3. We're going to have to move quickly here. Exodus chapter 3 and verse 7. Exodus chapter 3 and verse 7. The Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. The Israelites had been slaves in Egypt for years. And God heard their cries of suffering and oppression, and he felt their sorrows. John eleven thirty five. 35, when Jesus' friend Lazarus dies, the Bible says that Jesus wept. We can know without a shadow of a doubt, my friends, that God feels our suffering. He, 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 it breaks his heart. When, when we suffer, he suffers. When we shed tears, he feels sadness as well. The pain that you're going through, maybe a recent diagnosis of an illness or maybe a loved one that passed away or maybe a loss of, of friends or maybe some health challenge, the suffering that you're experiencing, God understands and cares. The third thing that we know about evil is that God will eventually judge evil. And I'm so glad, my friends, that God will eventually judge evil. I'm so glad, my friends, that God is not a soft God. Can you imagine if, let's say that you attended a school and as a fourth grader, let's say that you kept on getting maybe beat up by the bully. There was some bully at that school and he kept on beating you up. And the bully was taken to the principal's office and the principal said, hey, please don't do that again. Please. I don't want you to beat up anyone. We want this place to be safe. Okay, the bully says, I won't. And so then he gets off. The next day, the exact same thing happens. The bully beats up someone. He gets taken to the principal office. The, the principal says, hey, please don't do that. That's not a good idea. We want our school to be a safe place. Now, already people would start making judgments about the principal. He's a soft principal. What would they be feeling? They would be feeling like this place is not a safe place to live. Uh, or to go to school, rather. I, I, I don't feel safe here. Is, is, is what's happening to them going to happen to me? And especially if it happens several more times, people would start questioning the leadership of that principle. I'm so glad, my friends, that when I see news stories, like the one I saw a few years back, tragic story where some lady that was pregnant, nine months pregnant, about to give birth, goes to pick up free clothes from an advertisement on Craigslist and enters the house of a woman and the friend of the woman. And they tragically take the life of this pregnant lady and tragically they, they, take the, they forcibly rip the baby out of this tummy trying to take the baby for themselves. And when I read stories like that, my heart boils. And I say, God, that's not fair. And I'm so glad that God is a God of justice and that one day He will judge those that take part in those heinous crimes. He will judge those that took the lives on September 11, 2001. He will judge those that took the lives of the Jewish men and women at Holocaust. God will judge evil. Daniel chapter 7 verses 9 through 10 tells us that, that Daniel sees the Ancient of Days. He's being seated on his throne. He's, he's got this white hair and, and this fiery throne. And he sits down. The court is set before him and he is judge. There will be a judgment, friends, and my God will judge evil and injustice. That's the third thing we know. Number one, we know that evil doesn't exist and originate from God. God didn't produce evil. It comes from an outside source. Number two, we know that suffering and evil breaks God's heart. Number three, God will eventually judge evil and injustice. And number four, God right now is undertaking the task to guarantee that its presence will not be permanent. That the presence of evil will not last forever. We know that evil won't last forever. Go ahead and turn with me to Revelation chapter 18. We're moving along here. Revelation chapter 18. In Revelation chapter 18, we 
Here's some powerful words, starting in verse 21. Revelation 18, verse 21, we're told, Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, This with violence the great city Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found anymore. The sound of harpists, musicians, flutists, and trumpeters shall not be heard in you anymore. No craftsman of any craft shall be found in you anymore. And the sound of a millstone shall not be heard in you anymore. The light of a lamp shall not shine in you anymore. The voice of the bridegroom and bride shall not be heard in you anymore. For your merchants were the great men of the earth, and by your sorcery all the nations were deceivers. 24. And in Babylon, in her was found the blood of prophets and saints who were slain on the earth. We don't have time to look into who Babylon is and, and what this entails, but let me tell you what this does ensure us and promise us. That one day evil in all its form, that one day injustice will be no more. Revelation 18 continues that thought. It shall be no more. It shall be no more. It shall be no more. Revelation chapter 20 verse 9. The Bible tells us that they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Devoured is a word that means it removes them. Fire completely consumes. And Satan and his evil hosts and those that side with Satan and choose him will be like ashes. Revelation chapter 21 verses 1 through 5 tells us that God is going to create a new heavens and a new earth. John sees the holy city coming down from God. The tabernacle, verse 3 says, of God is with men and he will dwell with them. He will be their God. They will be his people. And verse 4 says, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more sorrow, nor crying, no more pain. No more terrorist attacks, no more pandemics, no more cancer, no more degenerative diseases, no more suffering and pain and evil. There's coming a day, friends, when that will be no more. And the millennium, the thousand years in heaven, God uses as a tool to ensure that the presence of evil will not be permanent. Because in the thousand years. Revelation 20 tells us that we, the righteous, will sit on thrones and, and we'll judge. We'll judge our fellow brothers. We'll, we'll judge God's character. We'll look through the books. Every doubt that we have will be eliminated. Avenus Believe writes this, to lay to rest forever any occasion for such doubts and to ensure that sin will not rise again, God will provide these answers during the review phase of the millennial judgment. There's three phases of the judgment. The investigative phase, the review phase, and the executive phase. We do the same thing in our American court systems. There's an investigative phase. They take evidence and different detectives pick up pieces of, of evidence. They, they investigate as to what took place in this crime. Then there's a review phase. That's what happens during court. There's a review by, 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 by the peers, the, the, the various individuals that, that come to the court, the trial by jury. They look at the evidence. And that's what's going to be happening during the thousand years. It's a, it's a trial by peers. We're going to be looking at the evidence. What took place? Is God a fair God? Why is this person there? Why is he not there? Why did God allow suffering? And then there's an executive phase. The executive phase is when the judge hands down the sentence, this criminal is guilty, and at the end executive judgment, God will say that Satan is guilty and he will be lost forever. Number four, what I just mentioned, God is guaranteeing that the presence of evil will not be permanent. It won't last forever. Number five, last one. What we know about evil and suffering is that God is not distant in suffering. But in fact, he suffered and experienced evil himself so that we wouldn't have to forever. Turn with me to our last passage, Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. Verse 3, he was despised and rejected by men. 
Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, acquainted with evil and suffering. We hid our faces from him. He was despised. He was rejected. He experienced evil. Verse 4, he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. He was smitten by God and afflicted. He was wounded for my transgressions. He was crushed for our sins. He was bruised for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. My friends, I want you to know this, that Jesus experienced the full wrath of evil for you and me. That Jesus took on the second death, the punishment for evil for you and me. Jesus went into, he didn't just, he didn't just, he didn't just have sorrow for our suffering, but he experienced it himself so that we wouldn't have to forever. That's what I know about my God of love. We don't know all the answers, but we do know that evil does not originate from my, our God. We do know that suffering and evil breaks God's hearts. He has compassion for those that are suffering. We, we do know that God will one day judge injustice and evil. We know that God is undertaking this gigantic task of ensuring that evil won't last forever. And that one day evil will not be around. It's not permanent. And finally we know that God endured evil. He endured suffering so that you and I wouldn't have to for eternity. My God is all-powerful, and He's all-loving, and I can trust that He knows best. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for this beautiful, beautiful promise in Scripture that you care for us, that you love us. Thank you for these Bible verses that tell us that while we don't know all the answers, we do know that you are coming soon and that one day evil will not find a home here on this earth. We long for that day and until then, Lord, may we continue to get rid of evil in our own hearts, in our own lives, and those around us as well. Come, Lord Jesus, come is our prayer. We pray these things in the name of Jesus and all of God's people. Those here in person and online said amen and amen. God bless you. Hi. Thanks so much for joining us today for our church worship service here at the Mentone Seventh-day Adventist Church. We're here to serve, so if you have a Bible question or if you have a prayer need, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Our phone number is 909-492-0738. Or you can email us at office at mentonechurch.org. And if you find yourself in our area, which is in the inland area of Southern California, please come by and visit us. We would love to meet you. And in the meantime, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and don't forget to click on the little bell. That way you'll receive notifications when we are live streaming. God bless. Have a great week.